Okay, now, got that sorted, that's cool. Um, I was gonna play a soundtrack over the whole <coughs> thing that would start later, so you'll miss that one, but I'll tell you what you missed because this whole presentation is about missing things anyway, so it's nice, you're missing something right now. <laughs> Not one thing, but multiple things, but you'll never, never know, that's the cool thing. I think you said that to me also. Oh, the girl, the lady in the, the financial department told me that. You're always missing. Uh, um, <laughs> text number in the yeah um, so I got the chance to come to New York and uh, actually finish something which means my practice my um, the works that I've been working on for say four years and so now all the works that are in New York they have been kind of produced between the last four years and now but they're only finished this month or kind of semi finished this month when they're in transfer gallery so it's a crazy catalog of work for me to put all that out. Um, just showing you a short image, this is it. We'll go, I mean, I thought this is kind of experimental. You know, when you're traveling and you're doing a lot of presentations, you have these like staples of stuff you like to talk about because it gives the background, gives the history. I thought I would be wild and um, actually put almost all new slides in there. So it's gonna be like a lot of new stuff, which is more scary for me to talk about, but that might make it better actually. But we're going back for a second, first to, th yeah, 2005, 2006, which is when I started working on videoscapes, and you can still find all that online. It's actually uh, one of my favorite media blog spots. Um, I don't know if you guys know that, but that's like a blogging software by um, Google. Uh, in videoscapes, because I used to work a lot together as a visualist, I like to call it, instead of being a VJ, because I work a lot with also live video. Um, so I'm not a video jokey. Uh, maybe on 1st of April I'd be that. But. Um, so Videoscapes is kind of uh, a collection of videos that translate audio artifacts into visual artifacts. So for instance, if um, with whom I used to work a lot, go to 80, he works with Commodore 64, so that's like a video game console from the 80s, 8-bit. Um, it is known to be digital, however, the sound chip, which is called the SID chip, is partially analog. So what he does is he puts like weird, or he works together with a guy, a programmer called Mats. Mats uh, programmed um, a software that would push for the volume envelopes and things like that, dirty tricks to get sounds that were not programmable in the Commodore 64. And I tried to kind of emulate those kinds of effects in visuals and try to make like a coherent collection between sound and visuals. And I thought that was great, you know? I thought that would give us new ways of watching. You know, when you're hearing a sound, it's like from the 1977, I think, Murray Schaefer wrote about this. He wrote about axiomatic listening. And his idea would be that we should all play sounds behind a black feel from instruments that we don't know. So when we start listening to those instruments and those sounds, and we don't have the reference, the context, or anything else, to listen to them, we really have to learn how to listen again, because we can't contextualize the sound. We have ear lids that are popped, and we have to really go and only go with the sound. Now, I thought that would be a way for me to work with Glitch, to give you something that is contextless, because there's not yet a bug report, so it's really a glitch, it's a moment that I cannot describe. Kind of an error that I have to, if it's really a glitch concert, I really have to learn how to look at it again. There's no contextualization. Just to be clear, like, um, I probably by now the glitch is completely vernacularized, but I'm talking about glitch. I mean the moment or um, kind of the technological moment that something runs a mock. When I put an image into uh, my Microsoft document, you know, and it all looks like. <laughs> That's when the glitch happens, and that moment is taken apart in an artistic practice, becomes metaphor, a metaphor for kind of against the flow computation or usage. It's not necessarily always a glitch but uh, in a technical sense, but it is about that movement of against the grain of how our technologies are supposed to work. So, I wanted to make videoscapes where I learned people how to look again, right? And I made all those videos, I pushed them online, and I put them on Vimeo. And that's where it all went wrong, I would say, like for the first four years, at least. I still do it, I still use Vimeo all the time, but uh, that was my main way of publishing my work, was pushing my videos on Vimeo and then that got onto Facebook. And what happens is that every time somebody looks at my videos, 
via this interface, they know immediately, especially when they're going via the Vimeo noise artifact group or whatever video art group, they know it's gonna be video art. It's not gonna be anything outside of my way of, you know, my conventions, my context. They'll be like, oh, it's video art, click, click, next, click, click, next. You know, that's, I mean, that's how I browse most video art, to be honest. Like, I wanna get a sense of it. I don't need to see it from A. That's how I browse mostly everything. So I wanted to take, yeah, sound and visuals out of context by putting them into Vimeo. Excellent. That was, <laughs> that was the biggest mistake. Um, but um, there will be more mistakes, and you know, that's how we make more work, by finding our own mistakes. So um, from that, I still developed this, but I kind of tried to leave it behind, but I'll get back to how I'm trying to make a solution that doesn't work. Um, from that, Pat Patrick shortly mentioned um, the collapse of Paul. This is, um, the Collapse of Paul was an uh, audiovisual performance. So I was asked uh, in Denmark for national television to make a performance about um, the loss of the signal Paul. The signal Paul is what you guys know as NTSC, but in a different kind of uh, Fourier transform. Um, so this was just to say goodbye and we went to digital video broadcasting. I'm aware that you can't even hear the sound, so this is supposed to completely. Um, it was live, I did it with a lot of video synthesizers and other kinds of equipment to live make this performance happen. Um, then I was asked to perform it in Transmediale, which is a big audiovisual or a media arts festival. I was asked to do it in multiple places. I also performed this a couple of times. Oh, for instance, at SASC and uh, Gene Siskel's Film Center, I did a big performance. Um, and then I rendered it and put it on Vimeo. Uh, it's like the return, you know, like every time. But there was a beautiful moment at, in Chicago, actually, so maybe this is nice, it hits home almost, just over state boundary. Um, after my performance, a girl came up to me and she said, I understood this, you made me cry. I was like, yes. It's the first and the only time I made a girl cry. And how often do you make people cry when you make a performance? It's like, I mean, we all, or I think as a lot of us that are artists, we try to get some emotions. These days with computation or signal-based art, it's less that, it's often about aesthetics, but I really try to tell stories still, and I try to make other people tell stories. So that fact that that girl came up to me and told me like, wow, you really hit home. I was so happy. But, um, but that doesn't happen. Now I need some sound, so you're gonna hear some clicking. I'm sorry for that. Boom. So, sorry about that. Um, that was not a click, that was just noise. Um, what happened is I got invited to do this performance, Collapse of Paul in multiple settings, and one was also in the Cinemateca in um, Sao Paulo. And I got to invite some of my favorite artists. Um, there was uh, guys that do shadow play, so shadow play is really before cinema. Uh, you really play with the shadows. Um, there was digital glitch, there was analog glitch, there was a lot of sound, and there was a graffiti artist that I invited, Defi from Argentina. And I'm just gonna show you that one other time that I had, they're not girls, they're still babies, have emotions. And I think it's great because these are like my two biggest accomplishments, I would say, so that, that's why I... <laughs> This is Betty destroying the screen. It's all about, you know, destroying everything. And this is what happened. Like a little girl comes out of the audience and she's going to save the screen. This is like my superhero in reverse somehow. child comes up and it's like, wow, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I think, yeah. Just turning down the sound again. Um, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is like, I've really tried my best always to tell stories, to build it up, to get a climax, and to get some kind of effect. However, it's often not about the effect in the end. People just look for the effect. So they look for an aesthetical effect. They're like, please put that. But it's like, there's a, a hard breakage between those things and it just doesn't always work. 
Um, I noticed that because I've been starting Bleach from maybe the Yahoo groups mostly. Like I would put my uh, experimental technological experiments on Yahoo groups and explain how I made this stuff. We always try to like distribute how we make stuff, or explain our technologies and stuff. And so um, very often what I noticed was that people would do the same thing and they would get stuck in this technological research. And so um, one of my ways, be besides making little children and young girls cry, um, was also to make uh, vernacular file formats. Um, so what you have, you, you get. And what is very often the case, especially in glitch art, but I would say in many technologically based uh, forms of art or uh, experimentation, is that many people often do the same thing. And for some people, if you use a technology and you're one of the first ones, you should own that technology. Nobody else, it's all about the aesthetics that are based in this technology. So what I often saw on, as a <coughs> fights on these four hour, like there was a new, there's still new compressions coming out, right? With every technology, very often there's embedded new compressions in there. And then there would be like an announcement, people would wait for the new compression to come or whatever, the software that would carry a new compression, they would glitch it immediately and then they put that effect on Flickr and then they own that effect. And it is not one, it didn't happen once, it happened so often. It was kind of sad to me, like to think that that is where it kind of has to end or that that's what people can achieve and they get like this, you can give them a prize. Yes, you cracked it, great. So I thought I would make the vernacular file formats just for people to have like, um, they didn't have to crack everything anymore. The ones that were already cracked um, I ex explain how they were kind of happening, like some compressions are actually proprietary, so you cannot get all the algorithms on um, the internet, but some of them you can reverse engineer by um, breaking them most often. You'll see like repeats of particular parts of those compressions, and you'll start to understand a little bit how they work. So I, in the vernacular file formats, this is like just a condensed kind of version of it, just the most used images that I used. Um, I showed the different effects of nine of them, or actually I would say it was around 12 or 16 of the most used compressions. And these are the ones that I used to always print. So I don't know if guy, you guys recognize any of these compressions, but we have Photoshop Raw, JPEG 2000, JPEG, PNG, BMP, Photoshop, TIFF, GIF, Targa. And so um, those are just for static images because sound and video and any kind of 3D modeling also has, you know, compressions or ways of file formatting and organizing data. Um, there's a couple of different lines that I want to talk about. One is also about how to present your artwork, but I don't. I think that's like kind of gonna go to the back. So I'm gonna skip this slide real quick. But this is an installation of that where I put it against time. It's very dark, I'm sorry for the projection. Um, so it became kind of an infographic, so there was not that much emotion. However, against the usage of this particular image, which is me, but it's like maybe six years ago. So that's what I used to look like six years ago. And now I look this. Uh, you won't recognize it. Anyway, um, so there is actually a whole backstory to why I use this image. but. Um, that doesn't matter tonight, today. Um, from that, me and Johan Larsby from Sweden built Monglot, which is a tool for people to really learn about the technology and to keep glitching it up automatically, but just looking into the different languages. Uh, since many upgrades, it sometimes doesn't work and sometimes it works, but you can still download it depending on your uh, OS. Um, Another tool that came from this was Extra File, which is made by Kim Asendorf from Germany. And he said, okay, it's great that you break all the existing file formats, but let's make file formats that don't exist yet. So let's create extra files. And because, you know, a file format is all about just organizing your data in a legible way for your machine, you can actually make any kind of compression, but you can also actually make anything readable in another way. So Extra File was really about how to organize data in your own way. And imagine as an artist, if you're making a digital-based work, but also if, as a painter. Think about Yves Klein making, um, what was that, Yves Klein blue? Um, paintings. He really cares about this color, and it's all about this color. However, if you put an image of this work 
inside a catalog and you compress it as, an M as a JPEG, you're actually also cutting away pieces of that artwork because you're cutting away highs and low of both the amounts of color and um, the, the, the form of color because it just compresses it into standardization of colors. So imagine as a digital artist making your work inside a digital compression and then having very often to send off your work to any kind of catalog for, uh, I don't know, for a film journal or for uh, the mom in your case, probably, you know, when that happens. They ask you to cut away parts of your art. That is terrible. I think it's like one of the worst things you can imagine to have, yeah, that, happen, that can happen to your digital art. So I think just as like explorer of artistic stuff, materials that everybody wants, any kind of artist has to do. You know, as a painter, you're exploring your, diff your ways of making paint. As, um, I don't know, as a film videographer, you have to explore the different kinds of compressions and sounds and what suits your kind of work best. Um, I think it's important to get your fingers for once inside your file compressions and open up your gradients, for instance, and listen to them. This a gradient is like the, you know, the change between uh, red towards blue or purple. It's this very uh, hipster kind of thing to do on your websites or on the cover of your laptop or whatever. Uh, so a gradient, actually, when you compress it as a raster file, it saves every pixel by pixel. So imagine sonifying that, listening to that. It sounds almost like, you know, a rainbow. So you can actually, all this data is very fluid. And I just always ask people to really get in touch with their data because these days, even if you're a painter, you still have most of everything still like showing your art on Facebook or whatever still goes via data and so it impacts your work. So you have to know about that material too. Actually, I'm giving a workshop on that, yes, tomorrow. But you know, it's just, this was just like, this was all just a commercial for tomorrow. Um, besides that, these kinds of compressions and um, you know, uh, standardizations, they become so standard and so ubiquitous that we start to look at them from everything that we use and everything that we make, we start to look at it from this perspective and we start to forget that there's actually other possibilities. Such as extra file, as I showed you before, which is uh, if you're kind of knowledgeable about compressions, you'll know that these kinds of blocks, normal files, they don't use those kinds of blocks. That's not a way to organize your data. Um, you guys that study probably a lot of photography and stuff will know that there's no such thing when you make an image in your browser or in your computer, in your interface, that looks like this. Even though everything is computational and everything can be computed, can be calculated, we cannot make files that have, you know, you can make it like as a mask, for instance, in a PNG file, but you cannot put a file in your browser and give it five or six or eight corners and layer it and move it around and start playing with the depth of your screen. It's computational not possible, but it is if you would organize your algorithms, if you'd build your own algorithms, but it's not via the rules of the system. And so we've been taught that video is still four cornered. However, why can we not like look at video not just from sound, image and time, but also on different levels and put those levels on top of each other. And I think these days we've, there's so many rules in our computers that we've just completely lost the ability to think about those kinds of questions. You know, what kind of resolutions are there? What solutions do they make? But also what compromises are being made at the same time? And what do those compromises make for lost possibilities? So really the lost possibilities, those those things that the, the financial department woman was talking about, the things that I'm missing all the time, that's, that's what this talk and exhibition is about. Um, just one more experiment. This is of um, last year. Uh, it's called Vertical Cinema. I'm just showing a little piece here. Oh, I need sound.
Um, what, what we see here, and the sound of my computer is incredibly loud because when I click it, it just goes. Um, sorry for that. Uh, what we see here is an experiment that I got to do, and I'm showing it here because it has to do with the US. Um, it's a film on celluloid. Uh, it's called, um, it's called, um, oh, next. That's too fast, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's called Lunar Storm, and it's about uh, learning how to see vertically, because everybody always gets angry, right? Because the iPhone gave us the, gave us the possibility to start switching our screens. But then YouTube doesn't implement that at all, so we get these like big letterbox videos. It's another way of those resolutions not working out correctly. Um, so this was a video that was made for a vertical standard, <coughs> but it's not just you know a vertical stand as an iPhone thing. It's made on celluloid and it's presented always in churches. So this one was had its U.S. premiere uh, at South by Southwest, and um, it was in this huge uh, Presbyterian church. Now you have to excuse me because I'm not very religious, so I don't know all the Presbyterian. The name's Presbyterian. Uh, and it was huge, it was 10 meters high, which you don't speak, that's, a, that's high, that's like five of me and more, and um, three meters wide, <coughs> so that's like two of me, basically. <laughs> you know, you measure with what you have, <laughs> I always have me. Um, so what's the point about that? Oh, the funny point about that was that you're at South by Southwest and you're showing like experimental cinema stuff. I think that's great. Like I didn't organize that, but then I got to see the tweets. And I was up until 5 a.m. to watch this Twitter stream where people in the beginning would be like, are you fucking, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> Watching stuff vertical, I'd rather lie in bed and watch my screen, you know, like this. Like, it was all this like, oh, that was the, what, the worst one that I should not say because this is filmed. It was something like, Vertical cinema, I could not wank off if I wanted to. <laughs> and then, you know, all the people that cannot expand their way of looking at stuff left because they're annoyed with new possibilities or something. And then they walk away and then there was a lot of nice tweets. So it was such an amazing thing to get this report on Twitter from people that just could not watch stuff. And they cannot take this as another opportunity. And see that it not only is something on a screen, but it does something to your way of looking. You have to start navigating the image differently. And you have, you're doing something to the space, because this whole Presbyterian church is built to go up, you know, where to go. Um, so it was an interesting experiment. And I think, you know, you cannot push everybody outside of their context. Somebody will cry, and somebody will walk away angry. And somebody will just have to go home and do stuff to himself, <laughs> and not bother us with that. Um, that was, um, we're almost at, I mean, how are you guys doing? Are we still, in, uh, yeah? Going strong. So, what happened? I got annoyed with myself for, um, wait, let me do this first, this other one that went off just before this one. Does this go off? Yeah, great. Um, I was talking about Vimeo, right? And about Vimeo not being the right interface to show your videos in if you're trying to make people watch without a context. Um, I thought at that point I found a solution when I went to um, Mexico for a residency. Um, I went, um, it was beautiful. I got invited to do a residency uh, in the <coughs> desert for uh, a little bit over two months. And so you're there, you're with uh, two other girls in this house. Um, I'll pause it real quickly, um, or not pause it, but just make it go on. Oh God, I give all the spoilers away. It's always the same with PowerPoints. You never can trust them. Um, so I was working in the desert with two girls, two girls, three girls. I'm very fiery. People can't always deal with me. I was told that one of the girls can deal with me because I am Arius and she was water and they don't, should not talk. So there was, there was a resolution lost there, quite right there. We didn't commute. Um, but so I thought, well, wait, I'm not, oh yeah, and there was this day, this is a terrible story. It's not really a story for happy artist talks. We were stuck in the arts space because 14 people were found dead inside a truck. 
right in front of the door. And at that point, I was like, well, there's so much going on in this space. Maybe I should just go away. You know, <laughs> like maybe I should just take a bus and go and then Google where should I go, places to go in Mexico. I found um, this garden by Sir Edward James, who is um, a surrealist patronage man. He was aristocrat in the early 1900s. And he really liked Salvador Dali and René Marguerite. And he would give them a lot of money to make art for him. So he was the guy that you know, financed all this perfect inspirational work. Uh, but he was jealous because of all these artists making his dreams. But him being aristocrat, he could not be an artist because he would fall out of grace. So he moved to Mexico. He bought a couple of you know, soccer fields, like huge space on a hill. And he built um, a garden called in next to the city, Geditla, and um, the garden is called Geditla. And it's really architecture that is not meant to be used as an architecture. What architecture normally does is direct our flow of how to navigate space and how to look at stuff. This kind of architecture did not make us move through space following a path. There's a thousand paths, there are staircases that go to nowhere, there is five um, heaters on top of each other, there's hands standing there, and you're like, oh, it's a hand. It's weird, and it's beautiful. So I thought I would go there. I took the bus. The bus was um, the cheapest bus I could find, and it wouldn't go up the hill. So every t I was sitting next to a very old lady, and she was so afraid that every time I went up 10 meters, the bus would go down two meters. So that's like, I was like, what was that? Six rosies versus two rosies every time. It took forever to get there. It started to rain, storm, and finally we got to this small city and we survived, me and the old lady. And I didn't know where I was, but I had GPS, so I could see in the dark where to find the place that I uh, rented a room in, on the internet. And uh, they gave me this little house, and I opened the door and I sat in the little house, and at night it was storming couldn't see what was happening, but stuff. So much noise the whole night, and I was so afraid. You know what happened? When I opened the door in the next morning, I was sleeping under an avocado tree. Can you imagine this? Like, it's all about things that you cannot see, you don't know, you have to interpret it. And then it's like, you think it's so scary, it must be a ghost or something. And it's just my favorite fruit falling down. So I, was, I went from like a whole lot of dead bodies to my favorite fruits in overnight. But that doesn't matter. It inspired me because I always wanted to be an architect. And I came to this space and it was just amazing. I didn't put any photos of Gritla, but I would always say, go there one day in your life. This really opened my eyes. Um, so what I built was a way to show my videos, not in Vimeo but in Gelita. I thought if I would make a 3D environment that I could, you know, be in uh, Milwaukee and give a presentation in a PowerPoint, I would not have to show it via this, like, you know, fancy click forward, click back, and that's how you go through time. Because um, that's annoying and it makes me confused. I want to be modular when I present and I want to be able to show anything at any time. Um, so what I made was a, um, I can show it here, it will play. Um, if it will show itself, yes. This is a performance I did, or uh, it's a lecture, but it, uh, it's a performative lecture. So it's not like the way I'm doing it right now. You'll be like, why the hell did you not do that? No, I will tell it later. Um, so this is in the Tate, which is one of the bigger museums in, um, in London. I had to present about Glitch, because at Tate they're becoming very modern now. Um, and I presented my PowerPoint inside of Geritla. You see that there's this like, you know, screen there, and sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. I can click through that and can click through my PowerPoint. And it was very laggy. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm not... Sh oh, no, wait, you know what happened at the Tate? I could give my PowerPoint to them. I had prepared this whole um, beautiful application for them, and they're like, where's your PowerPoint? I'm like, well, I made an application to present. And they're like, we don't do applications. <laughs> it's standalone, though. No, we don't. Can I then just put my, which works better anyway, can I put my computer um, uh, on the VGA cable? Yeah, 
VGA cables, you have to ask 10 days in advance, sorry. Why? <laughs> you know, why? We do, well, they did, they do something like Apple, streaming Apple over the wire, I don't know, Apple something that you only have when you have your Apple only for two years. Mine's just a little bit older than that. Um, why the hell do you not do VGA? Oh, it was because of the, the roller, the roller, the people in the roller. Ro it was a nice reason, but there was none. And uh, there are no roller chairs, wheelchairs, but no, no Helila either. So that, then I was a little bit annoyed with this, to be honest. Uh, I had to make a screen cap. This is a screen cap of me doing a presentation for the Tate, uh, half an hour before I'm doing the actual presentation to the Tate because I had to screen cap my whole stuff on my computer before I could do the stuff on their computer. That's how it goes sometimes. Um, these are also, this is not just theory or practice, this is also, you know, how an artist has to shake, like, what's that called? Uh, uh, shake it, huh? um, <laughs> So what happened is I got this review in wired, and you have an American wired, but you also have a German wired, which is closer to me, uh, because I'm from the Netherlands, and that's not the same. Um, and they gave the review, they wrote, that's me in my best German. Als videospiel ware compress process and flop. Zu irritierend, gerade zu verstörend, is die Erfahrung. Which means, um, as a video game, compress process is a flop. It's annoying, it's um, a noisy experience. I was gonna say something else, but it's not what it says anyway. Um, so what did they do? I thought I was presenting an audiovisual work in an alternative environment, so people would not look at, at it as video art. I put it into, well, I made my own, you know, I, I used Unity to create my own 3D environment. Unity is supposedly a video game engine. Now you can do a lot in Unity. I teach my students very often to make stuff in Unity, such as presentations or whatever. But because Unity <laughs> is, primor primordary, uh, is primary a video game engine or a platform to build your video games in, it's of course read as a video game. And so it sucks as a video game. Well, they're totally right. It, I mean, there's nothing to win there. There's nowhere to go, there's no, I mean, it's totally broken. There's no, you know, things you can shoot. So I put my, all my precious video artworks, my um, videoscapes inside this 3D environment and it became a video game. And that's it, like every time you decontextualize something, you recontextualize it as well. And so the way people read it it's just totally dependent on the platform and you can't get out of the platform or I haven't found the way yet, at least. That's next, that was the next failure of my life. Um, we presented it at, um, or I um, sold it. I sold this, this annoying experience to uh, the Museum for Design in the Netherlands and they built me this beautiful interface. So now it's not, you know, controlled by a gamepad. So it's a little bit more or less gamey, but still gamey because 3D must be a game, right? Um, so, that was everything before I got to where I am or where we were last week. And so where we are standing today is the IRD, the Institutes for Resolution Disputes. Um, this is the logo, it's also the key to explaining what the hell I did in that exhibition. And I'm going to try, I, mean, I have no sense of time because everything is modular and tangents in my life. So if you're tired, walk out. You know, like get some snack and a beer and um, you can tweet at me later. Um, so the key to the IRD. Let me tell you, a lot of art these days when you're working on the internet is based on encryption, decryption, encoding. This is very hip. Everybody wants to save uh, the people in the war zones. Everybody wants to, find, you know, it's like that's what it, where it's at. If you're gonna make encryption-based art, you're gonna win three stars at least. So you only have two to, two to go, you know, like that's it. Um, you're gonna pass. This is a Nathan, you can pass Nathan also like that, I'm sure, or Patrick. Not anymore, I destroyed it for you. Um, so I thought, I was, you know, we have these musicians, well, you used to have FX Twin, right? His work was sonifying photos. So he would take his photo of his face, 
beautiful face. And he would make sound of that. And that was like very advanced in the 90s. And it's very clicky, clacky, glitchy, glitchy, noisy. And that was where it, that was what it was back tho in those days. Now, people still do that. But of course, because any kind of data can become any other kind of data, because you can tunnel it through all kinds of algorithms. It's all fluid in the computer if you use it outside of the standards that Apple 1984 puts onto you, you know? Um, I don't know if you guys, I mean, I, I'm, I stopped, I, I made five references in one sentence, I think. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I'm saying 1984? Or do you know two references, or just one, or zero? Or maybe your birthday, then you're really cool, I wish I was you. Um, because I'm from 1983, so I was just before the switch, but I would like to be in the switch. Um, 1984 is a book by George Orwell, and it's about um, a very fascist state, basically. It's the future. Um, it's where people, well, let me just not tell you the whole book, that doesn't matter. What matters to me there is that uh, what's being described is a place where people only speak newspeak. Newspeak is a language that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. More and more words are being deleted from the lexicon. So we can all understand each other because we know all the words. It's great. So if you don't use the words in the lexicon, you'll get, you'll get hurt. Um, so newspeak in this way is making the world more gray, more boring, more, um, you know, standard. But it's also going to function. I'm not against functionality in any kind of way. However, I think it's funny when think people think that function depends on a framework that is completely set. But, you know, that's what George or Orwell writes about. And that's what Apple computers, in 1984, the first Apple computer, made their uh, first commercial about uh, by Ridley Scott was it, it was directed and it won a lot of prizes. If you haven't seen it, it's not in this PowerPoint, so you can watch it on your iPhone. It's wonderful. It's just like, woman, I can play it out for you. She, there's this whole metropolis kind of style building. Everybody's working, sitting in gray, bald hairs, no germs because everybody with hair is germs. Um, then there's this woman in a red, small pants. She's gonna run and she's gonna destroy the um, screen and she gives colors and there's like whoa colors and then a voiceover says uh, was it like what was it in January now I have to roll it over in my head I don't remember like January 28th or something Apple Macintosh will bring you the first computer and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984 and it's wonderful because what do you think this crappy thing does I think it gives us only newspeak, but that's me, maybe. But, you know, like, that's funny to me. So, IRD is against 1984, is not against, it doesn't really matter what we are about. We're understanding that there's multiple 1984s, and it's all about flip sides, you know, where something can be more or less, and where the compromise makes a new resolution possible, and vice versa. So, the Institutes is about that, making cryptographic art, but not, you know, how people encrypt their fancy things to um, be cool. I should retract this. Wait, I'm going to be more clear. So, um, for instance, we have a very, very, very fancy, I'm not going to put his name because then we'll get into a fight. Uh, Swedish, uh, his name used to, no, I can't do this. So there's a guy that makes um, uh, electronic music that's very hip in Berlin and of course when it's hip in Berlin it's hip in the rest of Europe so uh, what he does is he encrypts a lot of work what he did in one of his works and that's where it starts to rumble for me he encrypts a photo of the um, how do you call that like there was a lot of riots in Athens so uh, a photo of the riots in Athens and that's what he makes a sound of. And just think like, okay, that's nice. I know that you can make sound of anything. You know, I can make sound of a painting and I can make, uh, if I put the algorithm on top of it, it will become sound. Um, but what the hell does this dude from Sweden or Denmark or wherever he's from, Scandinavia, 
have to do with the riots. Like it's this fake political statement that we get, and he gets really. F He's very cool. And I just think that's the case with a lot of, I mean, there's also a lot of good cryptographic art, but there's a lot of people that are just showing like, yo, I can do steganography and I can do encryption and I can make things obscure. Well, guess what? The computer has made stuff obscure for us for many, many years. There's a whole lot of data that we don't see that's being cut out, that's being encoded, and that we don't get to see for what it actually is. So I just thought, let's flip that around and let's use the computer's algorithms to make everything super, like let's show the way the computer organizes stuff instead and make language out of that that people can't read necessarily and not just use photos of, uh, I mean, it's very important to put attention to riots, but I just don't think that it has anything to do, uh, there's no coherence there. So I wanted to make work about obfuscation and this is, um, I'm running through this way too fast, but I think it's gonna be way too abstract for you guys. I made an alphabet, and here are the statements, and these are the institutions. So the alphabet that I made, encrypted via DCT blocks, this, let me uh, explain this real quick. Most of all the images that you'll see on your computer, inside your books, inside your art history, Jensen book, I don't know if you guys have to read that, but that's one of the canon books. Any of those images are compressed very often via JPEG compression. I would say 80% of the time is a wild guess. Who knows what it really is? Um, JPEG compression is a five-step algorithm. So it cuts away the highs and the lows of the amounts of color and the amounts of light. And this, are, um, this is a collection of 64 blocks. These are all the blocks that any JPEG is built out of. So imagine that any image that you'll see, if you'll zoom in real fast, real far, and you'll put the contrast and all that real up, you'll see one of those blocks that are here, like this, those are the blocks here, 64 blocks. That's what they all consist of. That's how simple it really is somehow, um, to make it simple. I mean, I'm cutting out some stuff too here, but it doesn't matter. So I thought we would make like a language out of that. Now I'm gonna do something that I don't do because I'm bad at that, and, um, you'll have, and maybe you'll prefer it this way, so maybe that's a good thing that I'm following you guys. We're here, okay. I'm gonna read you the blocks. I got, I got a note here, so then, you know, I don't have to live translate it. But, um, so this is the secret that nobody else has got yet. And I thought it'd be nice because, you know, when you have a secret and you don't tell it, it's like a tree that fell in the forest. It never really fell, so if there's a secret but you don't tell the secret, nobody will ever have the answer. So I'm gonna give you my secret now. So this is what it reads. There's five institutions. Um, the Institutions of Resolution Disputes, IRD, call attention to media resolutions. We, while a resolution generally simply refers to a standard, a measurement, embedded in, techno in a technological domain, the IRD reflect on the fact that a resolution is indeed a settlement, a solution, but at the same time a space of compromise between different actors, objects, materialities, and protocols, who dispute their stakes, the frame rate, the number of pixels, etc., within growing digital territories. There you go, that's number one. I've got more text. Is this, I mean, I never re read because it's not my first language, so it's hard for me to read. Um, Coca-Cola helps everybody. Sorry. So, let's go to the next one. I'll skip the explanation for now. Uh, you can read that one day if I ever give more secrets away on the internet. Resolutions inform both machine vision and human, human ways of perception. They shape the material of everyday life ubiquitously. They do this not just as interface effect, but as hyper-opic -op lens obfuscating any other possible alternative resolution from the user's media literacy. Hyperopia is uh, a problem that people can have with their eyes. It's when they can only see in the distance and not close by or in the middle. Um, the opposite to hyperopia is myopia, and that's when you can only see stuff very close to yourself. So the computer really has a tunnel, has tunneled us towards what we are supposed to see. That's what I mean by that. Mm. 
next institution. <coughs> Short one. The question is, have we become unable to construct our own resolutions or have we become oblivious to them? Either way, we are indeed for, uh, we are in need for another re redistribution of the sensible. Um, this is a reference to um, Jacques Rancière. Yeah, but you said it American style. That counts. Like that was me being you speak fascist to you. Sorry. Um, so uh, the resolution studies is not just about uh, a research into the effects of technological process. Um, we also make compromises, and I've been talking about that. Let's see if there's anything right here now. I mean, I'm talking a lot about zombies, but I'll do that on the internet. Next institution. IRD intend to impose methods of creative problem creation. This is a reference to John Satram from Chicago. To bring authorship back to the layer of setting a resolution. The radical digital materialist believes in informed materiality. While every string of data is ambiguously fluid and has the potential to be manipulated into anything. Every piece of information functions within adhesive, encoding, contextualization and embedding. Final slide, you guys, we're here. Very exciting. Through IRD's tactics beyond resolution, the otherwise gray mundane objects of everyday life, and this is a reference to Matthew Fuller uh, and Evil Media, um, show their colors. IRD is not a winner cabinet of that media, uh, which is a reference to a show of Evil Media at the Transmediale two years ago, which I thought was a little bit sad, but it's a foggy bootleg trail for vernacular resistance. I'll explain to you why I thought, uh, why I think Wunder, Wunder cabinets are very sad. Uh, Wunder cabinets, when you go to London, there's a beautiful one. It's by a, a rich uh, British man who made his beautiful house in the center of London and he had there a collection of Egyptian art and beyond. And he puts his art down into, you know, like how old men, you can imagine the old man sitting there and he's smoking a cigar because that they don't smoke, they smoke yeah, they don't smoke a pipe, but they would smoke a cigar. There's different. There's a fight between the pipes and the cigars, right? There's different kinds of people. One is for bragging and the other one is for enjoying, people say. But that doesn't matter. Um, so there's the guy. He's sitting there and he's showing his uh, Egyptian dead art underneath glass stops. That's what we do. That's what happens in any kind of museum about dead objects. We put them behind the glass, inside the glass stop. We don't activate it, we don't let it live, and we don't let it really show. It doesn't spark our imagination. We don't let it run wild. We can only take a photo of it. Click, put it on Flickr. Um, I think the exhibition shouldn't be like that. I don't know how to really not make it like that, but that's, um, that was my fight in the IRD. How not to make dead art, but make zombie art. Because in the end, it's not living between us, but it's living in our imagination. And those are the zombies. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. If you still, uh, I mean, you can follow the beer drinkers, that's okay. I have a couple of fa favorite artifacts. Lines, blocks, and where's my other favorite? Vectors, yes. This work is about lines. Ooh. Um, it's called the rolling shutter effect. So imagine this, you have an air, you're in an airplane towards um, Finland and nobody wants to go to Finland so the airplane is very small and you get very close to this rotor and the rotor goes very fast and you have a camera, an iPhone and the iPhone um, also has a very fast shutter. However, the frequency in which it shuts it takes the amounts of frames per second, is not the same as the, 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 the rotor of the blades. So the frequency with which the thing rotates does not compute to the frequency of the amounts of frames per second of your iPhone. What you get is magic in the air. That's the rolling shutter effect. Now, okay, we get that, right? That's understandable from, um, from Finland. Finland gives us that, at least. This is the Nova drone. In America, the US, they do a lot with um, 
military stuff. So they also know how to make LEDs work really well. This is an LED that uh, pulsates really fast, so fast that the lens of your iPhone cannot compute it. So the frequency with which it's pulsating translates and you can put sound inside of it in the pulsation and it will become this. This is beautiful. It's made by the, uh, the object. It's made by uh, Peter Edwards. He uh, used to be American, but now he became Dutch. Um, it's called Nova Drone. And I, this video, I made it, or I made it with my, tel I was explaining it to my mom. So, you know. Um, so this is a video made with that. <coughs> then the next, I took that and I made it work for the exhibition, very bore boringly installed. I'm gonna break this fancy PowerPoint now. I'm gonna show you one of the works that hasn't been shown except for if you can go to the little to the exhibition if I can find it even. Let me see. Oh here it is, all the way in the back. Just real quick, I will not show you the whole video, though the whole video is not so long, but I can see Nathan almost falling asleep. So taking care of my friends. Okay, turning off the sound now, because, you know, we don't need all that humming. You got a feeling of the sound, so that's cool. I'm gonna read you the text. It's, a, it's again, a secret, so, you know, we're sharing all our secrets here today. It's how we become better people. Wait, let me capture that for a second. So, it's a conversation between um, a Masonic pig pen and the DT DCT language that I built, or DCT font, basically. But I like to tell you this, because this will make no sense. It's like poetry that's gone beyond poetry. Maybe it's just me being really angry at people. Um, Tested blue, which is the cipher, the encryption key. Between a Masonic pig pen and DCT. Dear DCT, you may call me an archaic old queef, but I still believe that nothing has more aura than the invisible. So here I am, nostalgic for secrecy and non-seeing, with my biggest fear, my, my expiration date, when they would understand my alliances and my cycle over groom waters becomes encyclopedic. This is, if just bracketing, this is about, um, well, it's about the uh, Northrop Tacit Blue, um, uh, what was that, like drone device, but that will make no sense now. Let me loop that, because that was such a nice um, uh, thing behind me. Um, okay, there we go again. You, my dear DCT, are not nice to me. Why do you mock my quest for radical freedom? Question mark. Then um, the DCT will talk to the Masonic pig pen. Dear Masonic pig pen, it's, hard, it's a hard question. How not to be visible? Does it mean not to reflect or not to emit a signal? It seems to you, it just means that she cannot own your signs. No cipher, encryption, or any form of secrecy is permanent, as the once radical enigma fell through a dump hello. We are all bound to become informed materials, products of semiotic deterioration, progressively enriched by information. I celebrate obfuscation inside a liminal space of the run length encoding, RLE, and the error. The conditions becoming readable to the OCR are flippant. An OCR is a scannable text. Do you, you do not need to become decommissioned, a decommissioned Uroburos, which is the snake, you know, that eats itself, so it becomes smaller and smaller until it's nothing, or maybe it's something. Um, because every time a new way of seeing is constructed, a prehistory is generated, and then we are in free space again. Okay, that was one work. You guys are almost gone, but I'll show you one of the last works. This was my OPI. I've already told you what hyperopia is. Hyperopia is that you can only see far away. The whole space was made out of 
myopia, so I'd zoom into JPEG 2000 compression so much. Oh shit, we're not, <coughs> we're still here. I can only see what I'm talking about. There. Myopia. This is, um, myopia was quite huge, as you can see. It looks really bad on this project projection, but it was pretty. Um, this is my mother, who was also in New York, looking at myopia. Yeah. And the final thing is the IRD patch with the key. And I'll leave it at that. I have a couple of IRD patches. If you're very, very interested, you can get one for the beautiful amount of $3, because we're... Um, I had to pay for everything myself, so I can give them away, which I would rather do, but three dollars is very, um, how do we call that, like, no, but it's like a, no, 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 it's a, you make a, a statement of everybody should have this, it's a gesture. Um, and it's informed by, of course, Trevor Peglin, who visited this space before me also. Uh, who did the research into military patches, because, you know, military rules the world, so. Um, I think we'll leave it at this. This was experimental. I don't know how good I am at reciting my own poetry, but it's not really meant to be recited. It's more machine language for people that cannot read it. So, thank you very much for that. <laughs>